Hi, everybody. Uh, those online, if you've got your video on, can you give a thumbs up if you can hear us? Perfect, okay. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's event on trauma and peace building organized by Generations for Peace and the Alliance for Peace Building. Generations for Peace is a leading international peace building organization with headquarters in Amman, Jordan, and an office in Washington, DC, where some of us are gathered here today. GFP has a mission to support youth-led peace building, and over the last 12 years, we've supported over 12,500 volunteer leaders of youth from 51 countries to design and implement peace building programs in their communities that address local issues of conflict and violence that they're most passionate about changing. Um, before I go into more about today's event, I want to give Ezra an opportunity from the Alliance for Peace Building to say a hello and to just explain a little bit about what the Alliance for Peace Building is. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Victoria. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Alliance for Peace Building. Uh, we are so thrilled to <coughs> co-host this event with Generations for Peace, one of uh, the Alliance's newest members. They joined us in 2019, and we are a growing global network of over 120 organizations working in 153 countries to end violent conflict and to sustain peace. And that means managing conflict when it is occurring, preventing it from happening, and a recovery from conflict in the aftermath. So um, it's just an incredible honor for me to have gotten to know Victoria. She is both a, a distinguished scholar as a master's student and fellow at Kroc Institute Notre Dame, another member of the Alliance, and I am so excited to have this opportunity to learn from you, and thank you for organizing. Thank you, Ezra. All right, so my name is Lindsay McLean Opio, and I head Generations for Peace uh, here in the United States, and I'll be moderating today's discussion featuring three distinguished speakers who have expertise on the intersections between trauma and mental health and peace building. So to my right, we have Victoria Nyandura, who is a champion for the rights and dignity of women survivors of conflict. Victoria was abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army when she was 14 years old and spent eight years in captivity. She went on to found Women in Action for Women, a Ugandan organization that improves the lives of women and youth through vocational training, business skills enhancement, and support from community governance structures. Victoria is also a Generations for Peace fellow here in Washington, DC. And then online, we're joined by two of our other speakers. Um, first, we've got Angie yoder Mena, who is the executive director of a Kenyan NGO called the Green String Network, based in Nairobi. And GSN's programs create opportunities for per people currently in Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, and South Sudan at the most local level to learn about the effects of trauma, begin to heal, and come together as a community to plan community-wide initiatives and structures to support healing and reconciliation. So Angie, if you can wave to everyone. Perfect. Um, and then we're also joined by Frederike or Fidi Bubenzer, who is a senior project leader in the Peace Building Interventions Program at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation in Cape Town, South Africa. In this capacity, FIDI contributes to peace building, social cohesion, and reconciliation processes with policymakers and civil society leaders across the African continent. Since 2015, FIDI has also been leading a research project on the interconnectedness between mental health, psychosocial support, and peace building. So FIDI, if you can uh, wave to us. Excellent, okay. So we are going to dive right in because we don't have a whole lot of time. So over the next hour and a half, we're seeking to explore the overarching question, how well are peace builders responding to conflict's impact on the mental health of individuals and communities? We're going to first begin by showing a six minute video of Victoria sharing her story of resilience at Generations for Peace's recent Amman Peace Talks event in Jordan. And then after this, I'll be in conversation with our guest speakers for approximately 40 minutes, asking them to share more on three key areas. 
Uh, number one, the symptoms of trauma in the communities where they live and work. Number two, good and bad programmatic examples of how peace building is responding to mental health concerns in these communities. And number three, recommendations for how peace building can better respond to individual and collective trauma. And then we'll then have approximately 20 minutes for audience Q&A, and then closing reflection from Alliance for Peace Building's Liz Hume, whom I credit for suggesting that we structure today's conversation around this theme. Um, we expect to have a fairly packed house um, here in DC, and then also with people joining in online on Zoom. So I'd like to ask those on Zoom to please turn off your videos and mute your microphones, um, with the exceptions of our two speakers, Angie and Phoebe. And then if you have the um, capability to do so, to change the name of your account in Zoom, to show your first and last name in the organization so that we have an accurate account of who's joined us online. And then during the Q&A, we'll be taking questions in batches of three and alternating between questions from DC and from online. Um, and then for those of you online, we'll ask for you to please ask your questions in the chat box on Zoom. And then Mina from the Alliance for Peace Building will be re uh, reading some of them later during, during the Q&A time. But that way we don't have up to 100 people um, competing to ask questions online. Um, and then lastly, we'll be recording the event uh, and sharing it with all of you in our networks in the coming days. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. And then when it comes out, feel free to share it to those of you, those of your colleagues that weren't here today. Um, one other housekeeping for those in DC outside on the receptionist desk, there's some keys to restrooms and they're outside near the elevators. With that said, um, we are now going to dive in and turn to watching Victoria share her story at the recent Amman Peace Talks. Victoria is a champion for the rights and dignity of women survivors of conflict. Originally from Uganda, she joined us today to share her story of hope, inspiration, and courage. Please join me in welcoming Victoria to the stage. Life can change in an instant. On an October night, back in 1996, when the people of Uganda were celebrating their day of independence, my schoolmates and I had our independence stolen away from us. The night sky was bright, filled with silent flames of heaven, when suddenly I woke up to the sound of shattering glass and raised voices of strange men outside my dormitory. In an instant, I went from an innocent schoolgirl to a captive held by the terrorist army. In an instant, my dream of becoming an engineer or an accountant vanished into the night hair. In an instant, I was ripped from my bed, taken at a gunpoint, forced into the rank of the countless many known throughout the world as the physically and sexually exploited. I'll never forget the day I was forcefully served to be the sexual slave to a man many years my age. I'll never forget the day I was raped and my virginity forcefully taken away from me. I'll never forget the fear and the pain I endured while giving birth without medical attention. I'll never forget the day I was so badly caned that it took me weeks to properly heal. I'll never forget the first matches where I watched hundreds die of thirst and hunger. I'll never forget how I prayed to God that I could join them in death. I am Victoria Nyanjira. 
I'll never forget the day my children and I escaped from our captives. And I'll never forget how my father, a proud and strong African man, greeted me with a river of joyful tears. I'll never forget the kindness of the people of World Vision, my first contact with an NGO after my escape. I'll never forget the day I learned of my scholarship to do my graduate studies at the University of Notre Dame in the United States. This is when I truly understood the meaning of resilience and hope. I am Victoria Nyanjura. I have not always been as you see me now. War is part of my life. It's where I experience many horrible and unspokable things. I'm not here to dwell on those things today. I'm here to talk about the redemptive power of justice. Justice is seeing yourself in another person. My calling after my abduction focused primarily on the restoration of justice to the survivors of war and sexual violence. I have worked at different levels to break the silence on the challenges and the experiences of women and children during and after war. Through the Women's Advocacy Network, 900 women and myself used peer support and storytelling to share our experiences, rebuild our confidence, and facilitate the healing processes. We then acted. We mobilized the petition to remedy the plight of survivors of sexual violence and war in northern Uganda. We petitioned the Parliament of Uganda. The Parliament listened and unanimously passed a resolution and then a policy for transitional justice. This experience taught me important lessons. Societies must seek to empower survivors, especially women, to advocate for themselves, their own needs, and justice. There is need to do more on those victimized by violence. I strongly believe that the empowerment of women is like empowering a nation, which is a belief backed by my faith. These days, in addition to my studies, I founded a new initiative, Women in Action for Women, to empower women and youth through vocational skills training business skills enhancements, which I view as a precursor to their involvement in advocacy. The state, society, and the market, let us join hand together and work towards building peace. I will end by saying what Nelson Mandela wrote in the long walk to freedom. Nations must not be judged by how they treat they are highest citizens, but the lowest ones. I echo Mandela's sentiments when I say, let us judge each nation by the kind and quality of justice practiced by its institutions. Let us judge each nation by the quality and kind of justice employed to its citizens. Let us judge each nation by the quality and kind of justice shown to its strangers. Thank you. All right, are we good with our audio? Good. Well, it's hard to go after that, um, but I want to start by appreciating Victoria for that um, opportunity for all of us to hear her story. Um, and to agree to allow us to share it today. And we felt like that's a good jumping off point um, to get into talking about resilience to trauma and mental health challenges and the way in which the peace building field is addressing some of these issues. And I look forward to throughout this conversation hearing from Victoria as she reflects a little bit on what exercises like that, getting up in front of a room full of strangers um, does for her own kind of um, mental health. So um, 
Again, the overall guiding questions um, for today are around how well peace builders are responding to conflicts impacts, uh, or how, how well peace builders are responding to conflicts impact on the mental health of individuals and communities. Um, so our first round of questions are talking about symptoms of trauma, because I think all too often as peace builders, which is kind of where I'm coming from, the field I'm coming from, we're not really pausing to articulate what are some of the manifestations of trauma on the communities in which we're carrying out our work. Um, so we want to be thinking about what does trauma look like in these communities where we live and work, and why is it important that we recognize the symptom of trauma in communities affected by conflict and violence. So we're going to start with Victoria here. Um, Victoria, in what way have you seen trauma manifesting in yourself and in the women who've been affected by war in northern Uganda? What have been some of the signs and symptoms? <coughs> Thank you. Generations of Peace Alliance of Peace Building, all of you are here present and those online for giving me the platform to speak. I won't do much in line of my past, the stories, but what I can say is, starting from me as Victoria, I think trauma continues to manifest itself. Sometimes there are sharp instruments or sounds that when it happens, it hits me back. Example, last year when I joined Notre Dame, Notre Dame is known for football. Mm -hmm. And when people are on ground, there are military planes, we were even notified in advance through emails that don't get surprised when tomorrow this happened. But that day, when I had the sound of the three military planes on the hair, I never got out to even know what was taking place. Because it brought me back to that situation when the, like, the rebels are fighting and the government troops are on ground, the gunship is bombing. So some of those things don't get away. To me, that really tortured me for some time, but I got over it up to now. If it happens, that memory will come briefly and then it goes. Looking at majority of my colleagues, myself on ground, rejection has been one of the areas that really made it hard for each and every one. Communities were affected. So seeing you who returned from captivity, it gives, it triggers their mind of what happened to them. So you're treated as one who caused that, even if you're innocent, and there's that bitterness. For some of my friends, they are bitter. Even if you're seated as a group and you're smiling, I have some of my friends just seeing a smile on somebody's face, they think you're talking about them and laughing, even if the story is completely different. So individuals are bitter within themselves, and there's that feeling of hopelessness. I have some of the girls, especially the ones who were abducted with them. We have gone to school and graduated, but still there are moments you sit an individual think, I think God already cast me. There is nothing good in my life. And I'm like, you're working. What about those who are not working, but still they are bitter? And there is that trigger of seeing a specific perpetrator who did something to you. When you see that individual, the mind is already off. One of our friends visited Gulu, where I've been working. She had gone to visit us, but she never met us. Getting out of the bus, she saw one of the perpetrators who once ordered that she should be killed. That was enough for her to get back to the bus and head back. I have been interacting with her. She tells me I can forgive, but I don't think that will move away from me. And as long as I see him, I can never, like, get back to that state. Then there are those who feel like, I don't need to hear anything about what happened. Even if they know it hurts them and they continue to go through that pain. Today, we talk of nightmare. Sometimes when I talk about this thing, like the day I spoke at a man, I get back and dream. I was telling my colleagues that today I dreamt I was abducted again. And in the dream, I could see, I tried running, trying to really protect myself, but no way. So the nightmare comes in, and sometimes you imagine that specific moment, especially if something hurts you, 
then you figure certain things that happened back at a specific time. And today in Northern Uganda, people talk about alcoholism, suicide. To me, I know all this is coming as a result of what happened. We are trying to address, let's prosecute perpetrators. But we, we are tackling these issues from somewhere, not the root causes. Majority go to drink because they find it is hard to really get out of the situation they are in. Then after the drinking, you can do anything to yourself. We have aspect of domestic violence. Any quarrel comes as a result of that. One of our women went to the village where her family comes from, and that is where massacres occurred. As she stood, someone was pointing to the mass graves. It is hurting to her as an individual. She didn't cause it. It was not in her making that the rebels did that, but showing her or talking about it in her presence hurts her more. She has never found peace to go back to their community. She's just staying within the town suburbs where at least people don't get to talk much about her in that angle. And suicide is not about to end. To me, it's not going to end. When you reach a point of hopelessness and there is nothing you see in your life as good, then the best is to think of what bails you out of the situation. So understanding it and trying to help. But it, today, in Northern Uganda, we are talking of the war has ended, people have moved on. We don't know how individuals feel. What is going inside them? It is a hurting. But because starting to discuss something like that makes it be like you're trying to, you're trying to awaken people of the past makes individuals to silence themselves and not talk about what they have gone through. And there is this aspect of referring to you as Kony. Kony is the name of the rebel leader. So if I'm moving, you're saying Kony. Even if I know in my area, nobody is called Kony. So if you say Kony, it means you're referring to me. You're just telling me to start thinking of what happened. And there's aspect of bad or men, which is Chen, people refer to most of us who are in captivity, they already have that bad or men in them. So anything they do, even if it's a normal thing, you will be referred to as acting that way because of what, where you were in captivity. So those are just some things. What is happening? Thank you, Victoria, for sharing all of those examples. Um, something that sticks out to me is that the cessation of hostilities in Northern Uganda was 12 years ago, and these things are still going on. It, it to me, alludes to needing kind of long-term approaches to recognize that trauma doesn't go away in the, the two to three years where there's a rush of, of interventions. We're gonna now turn online to Angie. Uh, Angie, are you with us? Yes, I think you're muted. You can unmute yourself. She can't hear. Angie, can you hear us? So you should be able to unmute now. I've just unmuted myself. Oh, good, okay, go. all right. So Angie, um, what are some of the symptoms of individual and collective trauma that you're seeing in your peace building work in Kenya? Hi, evening. So one of my new favorite quotes is from a gentleman called Brian North. And he talks You can speak up just a little bit more. And he, so one of my favorite new quotes comes from a gentleman called Ryan North. Um, and he talks about how our brains are wired for connection, but trauma rewires them for protection. And this is why healthy relationships are difficult for wounded people. And I think this can be said for deeply wounded societies and how we build healthy institutions and organizations is so complex and difficult for societies who are struggling with conflict and violence. Um, so what we see is that trauma is not only a consequence of violence, but it becomes a driver of instability. We see systems, structures, institutions, organizations, leaders who can't function in environments impacted by chronic violence. And by chronic violence, I'm always talking about this complex long-term violence that drives us into this gray zone, that moves us away from just perpetrators versus victims, 
Criminals versus Innocent Citizens. And this was from Tani Adams as she was a Woodrow Wilson Fellow um, a number of years ago. So what we see in Kenya is that the Kenyan coast, young men who are profiled and tortured by the Kenyan police, who begin to withdraw from their families and their communities, and they begin to lead toward radical um, ideologies. They begin to dream of joining Al-Shabaab in Somalia so that they can kill Kenyan police. Then we meet Kenyan police officers who are angry all the time. They fly into a rage at citizens. They use their power to intimidate and harm rather than protect. Um, they come home drunk and they abuse, they beat their wives and their children. Um, we also have young people who've grown up in extremely abusive um, homes who then engage in risky sexual behaviors because they're seeking love. And where then we see unwanted pregnancies. We see more signal, sing, single women households and an increase in STDs. So we see caregivers who become overwhelmed. And I guess the question I keep asking and I've asked as a peace builder is how do we expect people who are living in these kind of survival mode to engage in peace building activities when their own personal lives are very unsafe? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm describing is more than just vicarious secondary trauma. It's how individual trauma forms in what I call the chronic violence sleep. Um, within a community or society to become the collective a trauma that then drives more instability and more violence within the community. So it becomes that part of the cycle. Thank you, Angie. I wanna turn now to, to Fidi, who I think is gonna tell probably a similar story in South Africa. Um, Fidi, how is intergenerational trauma manifesting in South Africa? Mm -hmm. Hold on, we got to unmute you. Sorry for the, the tech. Yes. There we go. We can hear you. Thanks. Um, thanks, Lindsay. Nice to see you. Hi, Victoria. Lovely to see you again. And Angie and everyone in the room and around the world. It's lovely to be able to connect like this. Technology never ceases to amaze me. Um, yeah, the issue of intergenerational trauma in South Africa um, is, a, is a major one, um, albeit one that um, is, is just beginning to be understood in terms of um, actually measuring it and understanding of it systematically. Um, I found a quote earlier on which, which um, I think is quite sort of poignant and which really struck me, which is that the past is not an abstractness. It is a haunting present. Um, and I think we often think of the past as this abstract something, um, but then we hear somebody like Victoria saying many, many times in her six or so minutes, I will never forget. And so that I think is one of the realities that we're living with in South Africa, um, that people are living with memories that are very, very painful. And they're living with these memories in a context that has changed quite minimally. So uh, in a sense, there is um, a compounding um, compounding factors, so to speak. There is the memory of the past. Um, and when I say the past, we're talking about apartheid in South Africa, as well as um, colonialism before that, and various um, other systems of, of oppression and marginalization, which have shaped narratives in South Africa for the last 400 years or so. So if we look at that, and then look at the daily stresses within exist today in some of our communities which are riddled with many of the uh, factors that Angie spoke about in Kenya but also um, I know to be true in, in parts of Uganda um, then that makes for a very difficult reality and that reality again is quite similar to what Angie and Victoria have spoken about so um, you know we have out, just outside Cape Town here where I live some of the most dangerous communities in the world um, where we've just deployed the military in order to deal with gangsterism to deal with um, sexual and gender based violence um, single headed households the military obviously hasn't been sent in for that but violence has spiraled out of control to such an extent um, and I think that's due to, to all of these factors. Um, I think apartheid intentionally, and I think that's really important, intentionally ruptured the very fiber of our society. It 
pitted us against one another along racial lines, um, now more along class lines and so forth. Um, and these damaged relationships are at the heart of where South Africa is at at the moment. Um, and we also know that narratives are passed down along generations. Um, I myself am uh, the child of somebody who survived the Second World War and, was a, and my mother was a refugee from East Germany. And those stories, whether directly or indirectly, have been passed down to me. And I bear those wounds. I bear those scars. They are part of who I am and who part of part of my, my family and, and that is exactly the same here in South Africa with millions of people who survived and lived through apartheid. Um, so I think um, there, are, there are many, many ways in which we need to look at how, where intergenerational trauma has originated from in South Africa and how it is manifesting, but it is certainly something that also at a policy level we need to give absolute priority at the, to at the moment because unfortunately we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that the world continues to applaud. One of the major shortcomings of that commission was to put in place long-term mechanisms that could deal with the long-term um, um, effects of apartheid and systems before that. Um, and, and that is really something that in more and more dialogues that I'm in as a result of my work at IJR, I'm hearing is people saying we need to tell our stories, we need to share our, our memories um, and, and talk about the past and that such hasn't sufficiently happened. Thank you, Fidi. Um, so in the past, I've worked with Victoria and Fidi in Uganda and South Africa and I've recently moved back to the United States and now being in this, this role where I'm suddenly doing peace building work also in the US, you know, a lot of what everyone has been saying is also resonating with some of what I'm thinking through in this country. And that's kind of my charge that I'm taking up for those of us in the peace building space, especially those that are here in DC, um, to not just be thinking about peace building out there, but peace building in our own communities. Um, so we want to turn now to some programmatic examples. Um, so we've, we've got three similar yet different contexts that happen to be in Sub-Saharan Africa um, where they've, uh, the speakers have affirmed that there is in fact a lot of symptoms of trauma in the communities in which they're working. Um, so we now want to take a couple of minutes to hear from them on how in their own work are they acknowledging and responding to some of these mental health challenges? What have they seen working well? And transparently, what is not working well? So we're gonna start for this one with Angie. Um, Angie, what has the Green String Network been doing uh, to respond to the trauma that you described in Kenya? So we use what I call a trauma-informed um, peace building framework. Um, where we're looking to find practical ways to support social healing, um, where kind of the expert level mental health professionals are basically lacking. And this is in informal settlements. This is in places in um, Somalia, um, Ethiopia that are so far removed that um, the professional mental health um, practitioners who are psychologists and psychiatrists are really completely not there. But on the other hand, the communities when they do get there also look at them and say, but I'm not sick, I'm not ill. And they don't want actually the stigma to say that something's actually wrong with them um, mentally. Mm -hmm. So there's this really balance of what that really looks like. Um, our methodology uses um, storytelling. We've done a lot of watercolor paintings that describe the cycle of violence, which where you see victimhood, you see people hurting others, but you also see the way to break out of that that is already happening. Um, and we also focus on kind of the courage and grace of ordinary people. Um, this ability to kind of move past violence and to find where there are traditions on practices of healing um, and how do we break these cycles of violence. Um, we're a multidisciplinary team, so we have psychologists, we have police officers, we have social workers, um, mothers, teachers, um, community development workers. 
it's a really, what we've found is what we really need is, is this multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral approach because it's so complex. Chronic violence just never seems to end. And we're all faced, what we find is the challenges are with access to justice, security, um, overall social well-being. And this is what I heard Victoria also saying, is that these symptoms that are associated um, with trauma start to impact how governance is done, how security is, is rolled out, how development is actually implemented. And we've found that a lot of the traditional mental health and psychosocial programs will not engage in, in anything that has to do with governance and development and security and justice. And that we're now looking for new approaches to begin to do that. And we've now been asked in the last couple of years to develop and design similar types of programs to our community programs to work with the Kenyan National Police Service. And we're in the process of finalizing kind of a national program that the police would like to actually see across all of their police office and stations because they're having the same issues within the Kenyan police that is reflected in the larger society. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Angie. Um, Fidi, how have South Africans been responding to the traumatic legacy of apartheid? And what have you and the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation been involved with in South Africa and beyond? Um, yeah, thanks, Lindsay. I think part of the work that I'm involved in at IJR is as a result of realizing that um, too little has been happening in South Africa. Um, and that, in fact, as I said earlier on, at so many of the events and dialogues that we facilitate, people continue to say, uh, you know, give us an opportunity to speak, to share, um, and, and to receive counseling and, and some kind of reprieve from the, the sort of traumatic legacy of the past. Um, what is interesting about my own organization, and I think that's important to sort of admit in a sense, is we were formed after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and haven't at all overtly looked at psychological conflicts um, of violence um, and of apartheid. Um, and, and that's quite similar, I think, to a number of organizations, certainly in the transitional justice realm, but also in the peace building field. And um, I think we shouldn't judge that necessarily. I think we're now at an exciting point where we're realizing that we cannot, in fact, do peace building work without acknowledging and or rather understanding first and then acknowledging um, the, the, the psychological impact of conflict on, on individuals and on communities directly and indirectly, individually and collectively. Um, so we started having conversations within our organization um, about four years ago, five years ago, next year, um, and started sort of beginning, trying to begin to understand how the two fields can be brought closer together with the objective of, of aiming towards improved results for both fields. Um, and in a sense, um, the, the hypothesis that underpins our work is um, that individuals who haven't processed their traumatic experiences and who haven't processed their wounds from the past are unable to contribute to peace building processes, very similar to what Angie has just been saying. Um, we know that about one in five people, and, and in fact this is a relatively recent study of about six months ago um, that was conducted by the World Health Organization and then published in the Lancet Journal, about one in five people in post-conflict areas are, are affected by fairly serious mental health conditions, so trauma, uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and various others. Um, those are the most serious effects of conflict, and there are many others that are less serious. So if we think about these kind of numbers as being individuals who have experienced and are living with um, uh, the, the impact of trauma, and we know that people who um, have, have experienced these kinds of events in the past are less likely to be able to contribute constructively and proactively um, to peace building processes, then it's an absolute no brainer that we should integrate our work. And this is what IJR is sort of working towards at the moment. 
So we've been doing quite a lot of research. Uh, we had an inception conference on this topic um, four years ago where we brought practitioners from around the world together to get a sense of where things are at. We realized that very few organizations are integrating and collaborating with one another. We did quite a lot of research, which is available on our, on our website, which included a mapping study at the time, which I'm sure many of the people and organizations who are participating today in participated in, um, as well as a literature review. And we basically found that a lot of practitioners around the world acknowledge that we need to integrate and that we need to collaborate, but very few of us know how to do so. And that's as a result of a lack of tools, a lack of resources, a lack of opportunities to be in the same space because there is this sense of um, us and them. There is quite a strong siloed approach. There are also really interesting stereotypes that we hold of one another. Um, so um, mental health and psychosocial support practitioners tend to regard us as peace builders as being political and their work as being apolitical. Um, and so forth. So, so we've documented all of this and, and, and other things um, in, the, in the publications that we've produced. Um, but in essence, we're at a point now where we've, we're, we're starting to identify or, or rather respond to what we've identified in our research. And so what we've been doing in 2018, sorry, 2019, is we've been bringing mental health and psychosocial support practitioners and peace builders together in what we've been calling co-creation workshops with the aim of saying, okay, so if we need, if we both acknowledge we need to work together, because if we do work together, our outcomes will be improved. How would that look? Where are the overlaps? Where are the gaps? Where are the opportunities? And, and how might we work together in order to develop sort of a model, um, which ultimately um, can, can feed into something which we're beginning to maybe call something like psychosocial peace building. Um, but that's where we're at at the moment, and we hope to be beginning to uh, develop and pilot a, a training manual, a training program, and, and, and handbook in 2020. Thank you, Fidi. And I want to do a quick exercise. Um, we didn't get to do introductions because of the numbers, but just by a show of hands, um, for those in DC, how many of you would call yourselves peace builders? How many of you would call yourself mental health practitioners? How many would call yourself both? Interesting. And online, um, we can't see your hands, but if you wanted to just type in the chat box, kind of your identif or identification, peace builder, mental health practitioner, or both would be interesting to know kind of who we're talking to today. Okay, so we're nearing the end of this part of the conversation. We wanna to move to some, oh, I'm sorry, Victoria, you did not get to give your, your example. Forgive me <laughs> before I move on. Um, Victoria, um, please share with us what has helped you to address uh, some of the trauma that you've experienced and what have you seen work for other women in Northern Uganda? Thank you. So first to myself, I think the fact that I acknowledge I had already suffered and would not run away from it helped me to begin the process of healing. Because I know it's painful, but that is it. I have to live with it. Going back to school kept me busy than someone who is just every time you wake up, you're in the house, you can't go, you don't have a work to do, you have to keep thinking of the same thing. But one thing I can give example on ground that happened, for us, they are Boke girls after our abduction. Our parents formed the support group immediately the second day we were abducted. Our parents stayed united as they advocated for our release and everything their logo was, every child is my child. So that prepared their mindset that even if our daughters return, we should one day welcome them back home and support them. And all of us have been able to go back to school, which was not the case. So those ones who were just in the community, nothing was done. When they return, that is where they face the rejection and they can't do much. So social acceptability in communities where violence occurs is very important. Maybe as peace, builder, it's, peace builders, it's important to always try to see how best communities can be engaged. As maybe peace negotiations are ongoing, we are trying to address exactly the problems that cause problems within our communities. How do you interact with those who are not directly participating in it? 
to embrace those who are already involved to be able to live as something never happened at all. And among us, the girls who returned, we went to the same school, six of us. We went to the same school, slept in the same room. As during the day we are in class, maybe things are not working out. Back in the room, we are talking about what happened before. So as we kept on talking about it, that, that became part of our story. We, we were able to easily express it among us ourselves. And this also worked for the other women in the community. We have survivor groups. We had a program of storytelling, peer support, body mapping, where you just attach any part of the body. One person lies down, you sketch, then you start marking specific points you'd love to talk about. And we start telling the stories. One thing I would like to share with you people today is when you know all of you share a similar problem, you don't keep any secret. Individuals are able to express themselves because you know, even if I tell you, you know the same. And the way I can respond to these women is not the same way someone like Lizzie would be, even if she was working and they know this is above her. For us, we are able to talk and sometimes like there are moments individuals cry, there are moments you even smile. Not because it is not painful, but because you're trying to embrace it. So over time, as you talk about some of these things, you get over it. I'm able to speak in a gathering. Women who have been able to talk, be it on ground in Uganda, are not far from what I do. But those who have never had the opportunity to speak, even today, if they started to talk, they would break down completely and cry. So they, are, they have it within them, and this is continuing to affect them. For us as the Aboke girls also, another thing that happens, we have a WhatsApp group. Every time someone is busy, like having a serious problem, she's already texting. I'm in this problem, how can you help me? Of recent, one of my colleagues almost committed suicide. She couldn't tell her parents, she couldn't tell any other person, but she found it was so easy for her to interact with me to again get back to those who would help her out. So having that community, a group that really listens to you, give you opportunity to begin the process of healing. And for women who have not gone to school, we have this program of Village Savings and Loans Association. That has been one Thing that keeps the group meeting each and every weekend on their specific days. As you go to do the small saving, you're interacting, you're sharing your challenges, you're telling good things that is happening to you. Individuals learn from each other and you find life moving on. So these are just examples that is working out. It's not like it's what we have done as survivors on our own. I acknowledge we have a, a few organizations that, are, that offer psychosocial support, but to be honest, in Northern Uganda, that was not for us seen when we were returning. It, everything was received there, have them talk to them for three months, send them home, and that is it. So that is why the problem is real now. It was never tackled well. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Uganda is an example where survivors have really mobilized and formed groups. There's all sorts of associations, and this may be happening in a lot of other places, but I happen to have worked more closely on that. Um, and like those examples that Victoria shared, it's just like the tip of the iceberg of the different initiatives. There's also child tracing, where women who've returned have traced the paternal lineage and family of their children born out of conflict sexual violence. And there's all sorts of work on that. There's women who have documented the identities, names of children born in LRA captivity. There's just so many examples. Um, so Victoria and I are currently planning um, like an experiential learning and sharing gathering of sorts where we want to bring together women survivors from northern Uganda but also some other relative contemporary contexts like northern Nigeria so some of the women who've returned from Boko Haram um, like Syria and Iraq some of the so-called Yazidi brides um, to see if there's some com uh, commonalities amongst the experiences in these different contexts and then to also provide opportunities for that 
of survivor to survivor exchange, sharing of ideas and what's worked in their context. So stay tuned for that. Um, and if any of you in the room today or online have connections to groups like those that Victoria has mentioned in some of these other contexts around the world, um, please reach out to me on email um, or kind of after this event because we're, we're looking for kind of those examples from other contexts. So, all right, we are nearing the end of this part of the conversation. I um, want to give each of our speakers an opportunity to share some quick recommendations. Um, so we will start with Phoebe. Um, Phoebe, in kind of one to two minutes, um, what advice do you have for practitioners and policymakers for how peace building can better respond to individual and collective trauma? Definitely can't do that in a minute or two, but we'll try. Sorry. Um, I, I mean, I, I really liked your question about where are we at in terms of um, as peace builders and responding to mental health, um, which I don't really want to skip because I think it's important to put on record that we're really not doing enough yet and that there's a lot more work that needs to happen. Um, it's, it's poorly resourced. Donors are responding to the need for an integrated approach. There's this us and them that I spoke about earlier on um, there's this notion that mental health and psychosocial support is needed by women and children and women who survive sexual and gender-based violence, but that it's not something that anybody else needs. Mm -hmm. And if anybody works in the transitional justice field, if you have a look at the African Union's transitional justice policy, it's a really interesting example of where that um, um, is mentioned. So, you know, that um, plus the stigma that um, uh, is, is still around with regards to mental health issues in, in, in Africa, the lack of knowledge and understanding of, of what conflict does to us psychologically, um, patriarchal governance structures, which don't allow for talking about sort of emotive issues like mental health. These are all things that really obstruct us integrating um, the, an awareness of mental health and psychosocial support into um, the broader peace building and peace and security infrastructure. Um, and so what are, what, are my, what are our recommendations? Definitely to collaborate and to integrate, take every opportunity um, to learn, um, to understand, to demystify, and to talk about it together. I think coming together is absolutely critical. Um, an interesting little um, um, anecdote from one of our co-creation workshops in Zimbabwe was that people said, uh, people in the peace building field said, oh, but we refer, we refer cases to uh, mental health practitioners. Um, and then when we said, but what, ha what happens when people refer, there was this, we don't know. So there's that anecdotal, what happens behind the referral door um, and that real in-depth knowledge of, 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 of um, what the other field does um, in order to achieve their outcomes. Um, I think we need to also calculate the costs of not doing and integrating. Um, so there's a really interesting new report by TPO Uganda, which is a mental health organization, um, which has recently done a really interesting study on, on linking mental health, psychosocial support, economic development and peace building. And there a lot of people actually responded and said, um, you know, peace builders have been doing this work with us for years. They've been inviting us to workshops and, and doing all kinds of activities with us, but they forgot to address um, that we are that we're still grappling so much with the legacy of the past and we have so much unaddressed trauma that our involvement in, in those activities has been compromised um, so let's build on commonalities because there are a lot of commonalities between the two fields you know essentially we're all about rebuilding individuals rebuilding communities um, so let's let's work with that um, and and let's build an evidence base so that in 20, 25 years time, we're at a point where um, there is no such thing as peace building. Every peace builder, whether it's at the Croc University or at Macarera University, is, has an, a, a module on, on mental health and psychosocial support and so forth. So yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, Fidi. And hopefully through some of the responses to the Q&A, you can get in some of the other bits. But thank you for merging those two questions. So Angie, um, we'll kind of ask you to do the same is briefly, you know, where are we at and what can we do? I mean, I think it's very similar. My recommendations are to what Fidi's just said. 
Um, we're finally coming to an understanding that mental health issues are important in building and maintaining peace. And I take it even further to building good governance. Um, and that we have to continue to build the evidence around why this work is so important and how it's making a change and what transformation it starts to have if we integrate it into our, under our larger work. Um, like I said earlier, we have to build interdisciplinary multi-sectoral teams to deal with these issues because they're so complex. Um, and in general, both peace builders and mental health folks have to go beyond the binary biomedical -med models of mental health, which are based on professional expertise and psychotropic drugs, and we can't forget that. Um, and we have to start to change the conversation from it's not what's wrong with you, but what has happened to you, and how does that start to alleviate and change issues around um, uh, stigmatiz stigmatizing um, issues of mental health. Um, Professor Christina Bethel, she's actually always said that our, si our society is trauma organized, but we need these trauma informed approaches so that we can come to a healing centered environment. That's what we're going towards. And these are the kind of things that'll get us there. Thank you, Angie. Uh, Victoria, can you close us out with your reflections on where we're at as a peace building field and what we can do as peace builders and practice, peace building practitioners um, and policymakers. Thank you. I think at least I'm happy that there's general acceptability that uh, trauma is not much incorporated into our peace building work. However, well, what are we going to do? The discussions can always be there, but if we don't start to incorporate it now, then it means we are going to miss it out. And to me, I would say, this begins at that level where all these are happening. Is there a way we can put communities together to, be, to involve them in continuous discussions? With what I've seen, just having the survivors on their own also may not be so successful. Survivor groups are really important in that storytelling and peer support. But when you bring in the community to get involved, they feel their presence is acknowledged. They listen to what is ongoing and then they begin to acknowledge that, yes, we have a role to play in seeing how best we can help all of us to get out of this. And there is one mistake we make. To me, in, in, in most cases, the aspect of mental health is left, like for our case, that it's a government initiative. It's government that can offer that. We had already government hospitals. They had a section of mental health. And for us in the community, when somebody talk of going to that department within the public hospital, you assume already you're mad. It's not like you have something ongoing. Individuals, yes, say that one has now reached that level of madness. So you will not even have the think of reaching close to there. How best can we support, if it is government in institutions, to be able to do it in an organized way that does not leave those who need the support stigmatized, but also the expertise is not there. Uh, can we have interventions that maybe sometimes go on ground to address some of, of those issues, be it empowering those who are already there, but I will end by saying let us have I I issues of trauma, how best it should be addressed at the initial discussion of interventions that should go within an area, not to come as the last option. It is very, very important to have it there. Those who go on the ground, as you engage with the communities on the ground, start it earlier, then the minds of people get to be prepared and, and over time you appreciate. Like for women groups, it becomes normal if you're talking about it, but then there are specific issues that if somebody does not help your mind to think, you may even treat it as a normal thing, but it affects your life throughout. So I, I think it's just, us holding our governments accountable if they really say they already have some of these structures in place. Do they get to monitor? Are we sure those exist or it does not exist? And if it does not exist, 
how can we support those who need it best to be able to speak up and say, no, this is missing and intervention support should go in line of that. But trauma tackling it at a communal level, group level is better than individual level. That's one thing. I think one thing I just wanted to bring in, to me, what I see as try to work for some women, those who are somehow economically empowered, there is a way they also respond or react to what is ongoing within the community than the one who is really low and cannot do any other thing. There is that link between economic empowerment and what continues to affect your life. It's Thank you. Thank you. All right. We've now reached the Q&A part. So we're going to start with three questions from DC. Respond and then we'll go to the questions from online. Who would like? Yes. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much. My name is Shannon Orcutt and I'm not a peace builder or a practitioner, but I'm important in the part of another important category, which is advocates. Um, and I work with Save the Children doing humanitarian advocacy. Um, and what I was curious about was also on the recommendations from, from our speakers, given that we're in Washington, DC, what your thoughts are for what the US government should be doing to help support resiliency and recovery from trauma so that we're not only addressing it at the community level, but also at the policy. Yeah, my name is Mahdi Mohammed. I am one of the uh, peace building, the, the institutions who work for the Peace Building Center for Policy Analysis from Horn of Africa. Uh, just, uh, for quick comment, which is uh, mostly when we are talking about uh, the trauma, and uh, I think the most important thing is the lack of awareness. Because uh, when we are talking in Africa, the people they think when we are talking about trauma, it is as you explained in Victoria, it is kind of madness. So since we cannot accept and we cannot draw a line between uh, the person who have some mel mental problem and trauma that is different. When they understand the people, they can take or talk uh, at that time. And the, my question is, uh, Victoria, for example, for your experience, uh, there are a lot of people who don't have a platform they can talk. And it is a good initiative that at least some of them, they have a group that they can share their experience. Which is the best way uh, to reach those people who are hiding themselves and going not to speak? some environment it is not feasible that area so how do you think it is uh, the best way that peace pillars themselves or organizations can reach those people thank you hi i'm monica with activate labs and um we do a lot of work in trauma and uh, one question i have just to clarify um it was said a few times that people that have experienced trauma can't fully participate in peace building processes so I'm wondering, is that because we're not being responsive in our programs or is that because they need mental health first or what? I didn't uh, hear a follow up to like, what is the response then? Okay, I think we'll give um, our speakers an opportunity to respond. Thank you. Respond to those questions. Let's start here with Victoria and then we'll turn to those online. So just really quickly, policy, what can we do? People who don't have a platform, what is the best rate, way to reach, reach people? And the question about people who can't fully participate in um, uh, peace building. Yeah, thank you. So I think in terms of policy, most US government and other governments go through governments. Task them to have a component of how they are going to address trauma, issue of mental health on ground. If they are tasked and they put it there, then it means something will be done, but also don't leave at just making them have it in the policy. They should be able to communicate back what they have done and how that is working out. In terms of a platform, 
the groups like on ground can reach. All these groups are able to reach because at least there's an organization that tries to make you move to other places. And this brings me to also say something. Sometimes we make mistakes. If one person is already operating in DC, the rest want to go out to DC and do the same in DC. Yet you know outside DC, there are other states that are also going through the same. So organizations have mandates that does not enable them to operate in another district. And it means everything you're doing has to remain within that. So for those who have not been able to access that, it's as a result of interventions having not reached where they are. But it's something that can be done. But in our groups as the women, we went ahead to reach out to them. However, survivors in those specific districts could not have the opportunity like the ones where the organization was based. In terms of um, those with trauma not being able to participate in peace building, I think what is being referred to this is if you already feel you're useless, then why should I even go for maybe a dialogue? I am already nobody. Nobody will even understand even if I speak. So it begins within yourself. You have to address the feelings, what you've got to say, and then you'll be able to participate. But those who are able to easily share or feel they can go and listen to something they will do. To me, looking at the personal experience and so forth, it's just like that feeling you're nobody and nobody can listen to you, your presence within you. You're not important in life, so there's nothing good you can do. It's just that, that's how I could inter can interpret it in my experience. Angie, would you like to give your feedback to the questions and reflections? I think the last question of how do you get engaged in peace building or governance work after while being a part of, of, of a society where chronic violence continues to play a part. I mean, what we see is a great sense of disassociation of people not caring. Um, and what we've seen in some of our now impact work that we're starting to, to publish on is that when people start to be able to regulate and to deal with the emotions that they're feeling, they're, we're seeing much stronger uh, signs of wanting to get engaged and become um, advocates for something that matters to them. And sometimes that's around peace, and sometimes that's around um, gender-based violence, and sometimes that's around many different things because we're all very different people and we have different things that we care about. Um, but this idea that in environments where we're so inundated by a new program that comes that will do something for us, but we haven't actually solved um, some of our own personal issues. We don't want to get engaged. We're just, we're tired. And I think the young man in the front row talked about how do you get, you know, people who don't want to get engaged, engaged. And what we've started to do is we realize that there's a lot of caregivers in communities to such people, and you may not reach directly those people, but you start to work with their families and their friends, and they start to pull them out. They start to bring them out. So if we do different rounds of, of our healing program at community level, the first time we'll get a lot of families and others who are not directly involved. By the second and the third time we do our programming, they're now bringing the people who will not even leave their house or won't even come out of their bedroom into programs and starting to do the healing circles that we're doing. So the peer support becomes really, really important. Thank you, Angie. Fidi? I, I, I'm not gonna add much, because I think Angie said it, but for me, one of the metaphors that works really well is the that of a chain, you know, and a chain can only be a chain if it, if, what is it? A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And if we think of a community or a group or a family as, as being its strength being determined by its weakest link, then we need to make sure that the weakest link is as strong as possible in order for that chain to hold. Um, and I think if we come back to Victoria has provided us such a generous example of her own experiences. You know, if we're living with the triggers of 
of you know being at a football match and and uh, military planes flying over overhead or i don't know being at the post office and encountering a knife or a sharp object um feeling bitter not sleeping not eating i mean these are all impacts of, of violent conflict and they all impact on how we are and i think those of us who are privileged and live in safe environments um such as myself in my little privileged bubble here in cape town um or within cape town um we even we have 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 moments where you know we might be we might be severely compromised and triggered and and so i think it's just about imagining that and and imagining how when we're at our weakest, how we might be able to engage in processes with other people. And the answer is very, very poorly. And there is quite a lot of research on this. There is more and more that is being done. Um, and, and I'd be happy to share that. Thank you, Fidi. Let's um, give Mina an opportunity to read out three of the online questions. And I think unfortunately, because of time, this will probably be our last round of questions. Um, but for those of you in the room, can feel free to talk to Victoria afterwards. Um, and if anybody needs to know how to reach our other speakers, I'd be happy to make those connections so you can follow up afterwards. So, Mina? So, the first question we have from online is Are there any fears of reintegrating perpetrators of violence back into society? And would that require different mental health methods than the victims? Our second question is give me a second to scroll down um given increases in suicide and mental health concerns in multiple post-conflict settings such as south africa and northern ireland following peace agreements how can vulnerable populations be better supported and consulted throughout the peace process to support individual adjustment in mental health in the context of systemic and structural change and the third question is, what role do you see peace education playing in trauma treatment? How can you start thinking about peace with the, uh, how can you start thinking about peace when there's conflict around you? And how can you be receptive to peace education if you have not worked through trauma? Liz, you did an excellent summary of the questions before. Did you catch all three of those? Uh, yes. Uh, reintegrating. Uh, how, how does that impact trauma healing? Victoria, you gave a couple of great examples of when people had been reintegrated. Um, given suicide, the high rate of suicide following a peace agreement, and I know there's a, a comment on there as well, um, how would you integrate this work into peace agreements? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, what role do you see peace education um, and how do you uh, start working on or having peace education and understanding this when you're still dealing with conflict and trauma? Thank you. So let's go in reverse now. We'll start with Phoebe, then go Angie, and then Victoria. And then as you're answering these set of questions, um, this will be kind of your last opportunity to also give some closing thoughts. And then we'll hand over to Liz to do the wrap up. Um, I'm not sure I, I can remember all of those questions, but something that stood out to me was this, this notion of, of support um, during a peace process. And I think the critical thing is that it cannot just be during a peace process. A peace process is a short period of time. These kind of interventions need to be long term. I think we need to think about how to support countries long term after violent conflict. What should South Africa I think it's important to come back to my own context. What should I, South Africa should, should put what should have South Africa put in place in order to undo that deeply, deeply seated legacy of apartheid in terms of how people perceive themselves, their identities, the structural violence, um, um, the inequality, and and you know having a truth commission for two years shortly after the peace agreement, so to speak, was simply not enough. Um, we need to think far more long-term, holistically, um, multidisciplinarily about these processes. And I think the same is true with regards to the integration of perpetrators into society. And this is something that I think we're seeing um, in, 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 in all of the research that we've done is that you know, context specificity must be considered at all times. Um, reintegrating a perpetrator um, who has directly perpetrated human rights violations in the context such as Northern Uganda is going to be a very different process to reintegrating a perpetrator in South Sudan or in Kenya. 
Um, and so I think we need very, very specific processes when it comes to perpetrators of specific human rights violations. Here in South Africa, of course, we're dealing with an entire perpetrator class. So what do we do about that? What do we do about the fact that white South Africans, in a sense, are considered the perpetrators? So it's a, it's a much, much bigger question, I think. And, and one of the keys, I think, to this is dialogue and is ongoing dialogue, sustained dialogue on multiple levels in society, um, led by civil society, led by government. Um, but certainly it has to be long-term and it can't just be at the time of a peace process. Angie? So I think that one of the things that I've come to learn over the last few years is that trauma is not a mental illness, but if it's left unaddressed, it can and it will become mental illness. And that oftentimes in the last 15 years, as I've engaged in this space where people say you don't belong as a peace builder because you're not this mental health expert, I've been told, don't do harm, so don't do anything. Let's let the dogs lie. But I think what we have to really understand, if trauma is not addressed, it does do harm. Mm -hmm. So doing nothing is not an option, and we have to get involved with this. Um, because of us working with the Kenyan police, who, for a great extent, um, come out of a colonial history of perpetration and aggression, um, and it's, it's within the ranks, you see it now within the service, how it's, it's eating people alive, just their own tradition, is that they're seen as a class of people who hurt others. When I tell people we work with the Kenyan police, they're like, how can you do that? That's, you know, that's the worst thing you can do. We need to help those they've hurt. Um, but if we don't actually deal with the mental health issues of these trauma issues of those who hurt others, they only continue to hurt more. And they hurt other people and the cycle just continues. So I think one of the things that um, we as peace builders bring into the mental health um, conversation is our understanding of the cycle of violence and how we can learn how to break that. And healing is a great potential part of that for both those who are hurt and those who hurt others. Thank, Thank you. you. So in terms of reintegration of perpetrators, if I look at Northern Uganda, uh, the perpetrators upon return, most of them were reinstated into the army. So that gave them ground to live freely within the community and already they are employed, they are earning something. And that hurts other people because they did not feel it. As women, children continue to go through the pain, for them they never felt it. And because they are in the army, they continue to hold the gun already in captivity, we respected them. Now they have the gun. Every time like you meet some of these people already, you don't have a chase, you have no voice, you just talk. And the amnesty was, we had a blanket amnesty that bailed them completely of what they had done while in captivity. So as it said, it refers, it, it differs in different contexts, but I think it's important to be mindful of how reintegration affect the different categories, survivors and the community at large. To me, I would think based on what we read about Sierra Leone, it's important you cater for all the people who have been affected by war in one way or another. Otherwise, the community can fail you in also easily establishing yourself within them. So I think it's important we cater for all the categories, minor thinking. For us, we came to understand the, re the perpetrators had to be reinstated as one way of preventing them from getting back to captivity if they find life hard, which is good in terms of prevention. But then what about the others you're not catering for them? What have you got to do for the women? That did not happen. And I also agree with Fidi on the aspect of sustainability of how we design our programs. In most cases, when something happens, we look at one, two, three, two years. That does not happen. Within the first year, like 
you're happy, at least you hope that pain, the running, the death you were seeing. So there is nothing much of what life looks like after three years when you're home. You're just excited. Even if the pain is there, you're also happy. At least you relieve yourself somewhere. As you start thinking, it is now not there. So it's important we look at some of this community. Where will they be beyond 10 years? If we start planning it at the initial stage, then there is possibility. Our impacts will always be felt. This education to me is good because we get to learn, to understand and appreciate and then think deeper on how best to address situations that are at hand and any possible situation that can come in future. So peace education is really good. I, I, I really like that component, but sometimes they also fail to extend it on ground where some of these things are happening. The, the, the awareness being it's at some level, but on ground where we need to extend it is not there, just as you said, even awareness of trauma is not there. So if we can design some programs in a simple way that helps to give an understanding to the people that are already going through this or within such context, to give them a picture. I looked at uh, when we presented the petition, even our parliamentarians didn't know. Others felt like they didn't know what transitional justice was all about. So they started reading. So I think it's just good. And I will only leave us with one thing. I really appreciate what peace builders are doing around the world, but sometimes we fail to refer individuals, even when the opportunities, you concentrate in line of what you're doing. And even if you know maybe this one would benefit from livelihood, maybe psychosocial support, if I refer them, we tend to ignore that. It's a humble request that whenever we go or where we are, where you can't, if, if there is somebody who does, kindly refer them. Maybe they can benefit from it. Yeah, thank you. Well, I so, guess bef before we hand yeah. over to Liz, can we just have a round of applause to, for all of our speakers today? So I just want to thank everybody. And thank you, Victoria and Angie and Frida. Um, what to have a great honest conversation when Lindsay and I first talked about this with Victoria um, we wanted to have a conversation where we talked about the good what you know what we have done right um, whether peace builders or mental health practitioners but just as importantly where have we failed what have we done wrong and so that was the one one question I don't know if you remember Victoria I asked you what could we have done differently what what was missing how did how did you come out of this and be so resilient what was you know and you're looking for that you know maybe one ingredient um, that worked for you so that so that was how we came up with this um, discussion I just want to go through some of the key points I think everything that you guys said has just been phenomenal but Angie really hit home on the systems approach um, peer support groups um, the integration working with police I know when you said you were working with the Kenya police I mean I even you know so I've got, you know, had a little bit of a, t you know, took a little take back, um, but you're right. Uh, you know, every, you know, all these people are part of this system and you can't just work here in one part of it without the other components of it. So, um, uh, I think also, um, Pri, you were talking about the evidence base. This is, I mean, you know, I, I started and was like, that's music for my ears. We have so much programming. I was just, uh, you're laughing. I was just, uh, I, I was just at another event where I was talking about this on, um, uh, with regard to DDR programming. But there's so much out there in, ther in uh, terms of theories of change that we say work, but we have no evidence to back it up. We don't know. Um, and in fact, sometimes, uh, Victoria, like you pointed out, we've actually done harm um, because you know, a program that I would design for my brain um, makes no sense whatsoever for, you know, another part of the world, for example. So, um, so I, and, and, and I, I want to thank the person who asked about policy. One of the things we also talked about putting this event together 
is writing this up in terms of, you know, what, what, what is the issue we're trying to solve? What is the problem we're trying to solve? And what do we know and what do we don't know? And how can donors and implementers um, do it differently? And then Victoria, you gave such amazing examples and made this all come to life. And I have to tell you, I wanted to like smack my head. Um, one of the things you were talking about uh, when I was working on programming in Ethiopia and Gambala, um, significant amount of violence, um, violent conflict, domestic abuse, and we were implementing a small, you know, savings loan program for women. And I was like, my gosh, why didn't we attach a trauma or, or some psychosocial program with it? And, uh, and that to me is uh, so key. The in, exactly what you said, the integration and survivors being part of the programming and actually really leading it. Um, so anyway, th those are, those are some of the key takeaways that I, um, heard. One of the things I just want to mention, I think on the peace agreement question, I don't know who asked that question. I think it was online. I think what the person was referring to, and now it actually piqued my interest. Um, you know, we have peace agreements that are made for, um, made by a lot of men and a lot of men that have been in power, um, and it's very focused on you know their issues around power sharing or um the columbia uh peace agreement is pretty extensive and goes down in terms of reconciliation and i mean even though it's it's having its significant challenges right now but i want to go back and actually look at it because that's one of the best peace agreements that we've seen to try to deal with um drivers of conflict and did they even uh, I can't remember if that's even in there. So I think that's what people were talking about in terms of having um, this, you know, reconciliation, mental health, being part of what is needed in a long-term uh, peace process. Um, so anyway, so with that, I'm going to leave it and just once again, thank you all uh, for such an incredibly honest conversation and the really important places that I think um, we need to go. Uh, in terms of policy and evidence. And mm, so we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Thank you, everybody online. Okay. Yeah. Good. <sighs> Good. Great. Victoria, when do you leave? Are you excited to go back? Are you excited to go back? I know you haven't seen your children. How long has it been? I'm going to miss seeing your smiling face around the office. I'm going to see her. She's going back to everything. Oh, you're going back to another day. You're going back to another day. They know or they don't know. I remember you and I, we talked about it. You were telling me. But it's amazing community members don't talk about it, or is it kind of one of those public secrets?